So Steve Vanowski is going to talk about something that's very, very technical. But uh, this guy's got the chops, and he's brilliant, and uh, we're really quite honored to have him here. So please welcome Steve Vanowski. <clears throat> Thanks, Garrett. So Garrett says to go fast. So uh, how many C programmers, pro programmers do we have here? Oh, good. I won't scare you then. Uh, people talk about Erlang for concurrency, fault tolerance, all that stuff, but often overlooked is integration. And there's different ways of integrating things with Erlang. Like uh, I think Irina said earlier, Erlang's good for controlling things. So if you have a control plane, Erlang is great for that. Data plane, you should do that yourself. But um, here's some of the ways of taking external things and kind of uniting them with Erlang. You can use ports, which is like setting up a pipe to an external program. Uh, you can write a C node or a Java node. And you can always use the uh, networking that's built into Erlang as well. And for internal integration, you have BIFs that are already built into the virtual machine. Port drivers, which are chunks of C code that adhere to the driver interface. And that's kind of callback driven. The emulator calls you on certain actions, and you take action, um, or certain events, I mean. And then there's native implemented functions, NIFs. How many have written NIFs? Ooh, not very many. OK, uh, here's some examples of integration with Erlang. So rebar, how many use rebar? Probably quite a few. Where's Tristan? Uh, we were supposed to ask him a question today, weren't we? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so rebar uses ports for interacting with external commands. The INET driver that's built into Erlang is written in C, and it provides all the networking. If you ever want to look at uh, some interesting C code, go look at that. And then LevelDB. Uh, is a C++ library from Google. At Basho, we wrap that into E-level DB, DB, and it's a persistence backend for REAC, and that is a native implemented function. So in terms of NIFs, the way it works is you start with a regular module, regular functions. The functions themselves, you can provide default, uh, or default bodies for the functions that will run if you allow them to, if they're not overwritten by the NIF. Or you can just stub the function out and have it raise an error. The NIFs themselves are native functions, typically C, C++, that live in a shared library. And the module typically specifies this onload directive. And onload, you provide a function that is run when that module is loaded. And that function loads the NIF. When the NIF loads, the runtime goes through the NIF looking at a table of function pointers and names and arities, and it replaces the functions that are in the beam, you know, replaces the, the uh, functions that are in your compiled module with new instructions that basically go off to uh, do these NIFs. Um, so here's an example. If you want to go to GitHub, if you want to like saturate the network, you can go to my site on GitHub, Vinovsky, and this Bitwise repo has all the code I'm going to show you today, and it has the slides as well if you want. But uh, I'm just going to have this example module called bitwise, and it provides one function called XOR. It takes a binary and a byte, and it just does an XOR of that byte with every byte in the binary, returns a new binary. And uh, it looks like this. So there's our onload up there. And the init function that onload is invoking looks like this. It's just finding the name of the shared library, basically. And by the way, my code would probably really make Garrett angry. So too bad. Um, so we're basically finding the shared library name. And then at the very end there, we're calling load nif to load that thing. Here's the XOR function. Like I said before, it's just stubbed out. If this were to run in, in Erlang, it means that our library didn't load correctly. OK. The nif itself, now we get into some C code. All nifs look like this. They take an argc and a, an array of terms. And the first thing that NIF has to do is basically take those terms and figure out what types they are. So we know we want a binary and a byte. So it's saying if our argument count is wrong or if we're not getting a binary and we're not getting a, a byte, then we want to raise uh, an exception, bad argument. Otherwise, if we got an empty binary, we just return that. And then we allocate a binary of the same size as the incoming binary. We run through it with the XOR operation right there, and return the binary. Any questions on that? Pretty clear. 
All right, so now we need big data. Everybody needs big data these days. So I happen to have a file called Big Data. You can see its name right there. And I, I read that in, and I got 2 billion bytes. That's big. Let's uh, time it. If we time it, you can see that we get something that runs in six seconds. Um, I have it returning a binary and this other value I'll talk about later. But uh, six seconds is really bad. Anybody know why? Let's talk about how processes are, uh, are handled in Erlang. So you have a multi-core system, core one to core n. The dots in the middle are like other cores that are too lazy to draw. Uh, then you have the operating system kernel threads on top of that. You've got the Erlang VM sitting on top of that. There are SMP scheduler threads by default one per core. You can change that with uh, options at startup time, but by default you get one of those per core. And each of those has a run queue, or actually has multiple, but let's just say it has one run queue, and in the run queue you have processes. So each core, each, each scheduler is basically going to that run queue, taking the process, running it, and then taking another one, running it, etc. Okay, to schedule a process, you take, like I said, process from a run queue. What the scheduler does is it runs that, that process for 2,000 reductions or function calls, or until that process waits for a message, then it swaps it out and runs another one. Um, if you want a lot more details, if you go to uh, Jesper's blog he wrote in 2013, he wrote about how Erlang does scheduling. So I would encourage you to read that. There's a lot of detail in there. But it's kind of like a mini operating system. It's taking a process, running it, swapping it out, bringing another one in. There's something called thread progress. And uh, not thread progress, but thread progress. Um, it's the way the schedulers work is they cooperate with each other. If they were all taking locks on shared data structures, um, there would be tons of uh, basically ping-ponging cache lines across the processors. It's very, very bad for scalability. So what thread progress is, is basically the schedulers kind of report where they are because the emulator is running kind of like a big loop. You know, it's just running instructions and doing the same thing over and over and over again. Uh, the schedulers report where they are to each other in that loop. And the other, like if a scheduler is um, wanting to get rid of a data structure, but it's not sure if the others are sharing it still, it can wait and say, I want to wait until everybody's hit this one point of thread progress. And then once it gets there, it knows nobody else is using it and it can get rid of it. There's some good documents under the uh, OTP repo on GitHub. This um, internal doc directory, it's not very well advertised, but there's a document on thread progress that's down there if you want more details. So this basically helps scalability of the Erlang VM. And um, what happens if you run that NIF that took about six seconds? What you're doing there is you're blocking a scheduler. That scheduler thread is actually just running that C code for six seconds. It's not doing anything else. It's not swapping out processes, not looking at its run queue. It's not uh, handling auxiliary um, uh, data that, that the schedulers all share, that kind of stuff. It's just running your C code. When you do that, you block the scheduler from making thread progress. That means other schedulers are also kind of held up waiting for that thread. Um, the rule, the general rule, is a NIF should not run for more than like one to two milliseconds. Now, if you go through the documents, um, different parts of the documentation for Erlang say one millisecond. There's another part that says 100 milliseconds. Uh, I would put it more on the lower side if I, if I were you. Don't trust the 100 millisecond. That's, that's really pushing it stayed around the one to two millisecond. Um, and then also, when you're running a NIF, you should be counting reductions, because that six second NIF is certainly not one reduction, which is what it get, gets counted as. It's more like, you know, should be 12,000 reductions, roughly. How many have heard of scheduler collapse? There's been some discussion about it on the Erlang mailing list, but basically with REOC, we saw at uh, some customers one in particular where the Erlang schedulers would just go to sleep and one would be running and trying to take the entire load of the whole system on one scheduler. The other schedulers are sitting there idle and we're not really sure why they're idle. Scott Fritchie did a lot of work in discovering this and trying to figure it out. He found that if you, um, 
if you put the schedulers, the ones that are idle, if you put them to sleep using system flag or whatever from the shell and then bring them back online, they all come back and they start operating again. So he and I wrote a program that would, I would you know, basically look at the CPUs, try to guess if they were in this state of scheduler collapse, do that automatically to the schedulers, and we actually ran that in production at the customer while we tried to figure this out. Turned out to be caused by misbehaving NIFs. Uh, if you think about a, a persistence backend like E-Level DB, if it goes to do a compaction of data, that could take, you know, tens of seconds. So you imagine a NIF call going in the, into the library, the C++ library, and the library says, oh, I need to compact some data or move data from one level to another the way Level DB works. And it can take quite a long time. So that was really kind of messing us up. If you go to this NIF wait repository, you can get a program that may, for you, uh, cause scheduler collapse if you want to run it. I have never been able to make it happen myself. So let's count some reductions. Here's a function, again, not following Garrett's rules, but uh, it's because I have to go fast. No. Uh, so what we're going to do is just look at this part in the middle. We're basically just saying, how many reductions have we run so far? Then we're going to call a function, which is one of our NIFs, and then we're just going to call that reduction call again and see what the values are. So let's run it on this bad thing, you know, bitwise XOR bad, which is the one that just runs for six seconds, roughly. And we can see that it took almost six seconds and only four reductions occurred. And that's what I was saying earlier. A reduction is one function call, so technically it's right, but it's really not because if it were an Erlang function, there'd be a lot more reductions. And a NIF is supposed to replace an Erlang function. So one way to, to work around this is to break your data into chunks. We could take that 2 billion byte binary and just break it up. Then you can call this bad function repeatedly and keep the data short, and then that NIF won't take so long, but then you have to combine all the results. So if we do that, we can just guess at a value. Here it's 4 meg, so we'll start with 4 meg, and we just run through, and as long as we have you know, enough data to split it, we split it. If we don't, then we're finished. We run it one more time. And I counted the number of times we went through this loop on our data. And the result, you know, I'll show on the next page. But basically, the problem here is how do we know what the optimal chunk size should be? I don't know. We just uh, uh, kind of arbitrarily guessed at 4 meg. You could run it multiple times, maybe get a better value. But then what happens if you new, uh, move to a different machine? That value is going to change. So if we run this one, you can see that it takes uh, almost eight seconds. We ran through 476 loops, so that's not bad. The reduction count is accurate because it's pretty much done in, in Erlang. Probably could be better, but it's, it's better than before. And we really never blocked the scheduler because that NIF didn't take too long. All right, a uh, better approach. So 17.3 came out last week. Who's got it? You need to get it. Some cool stuff in there. Um, I added this new function called enif schedule nif. And basically what that does is it lets you write your nifs to yield the scheduler. Uh, you pass a name, I'll show an example, but you pass basically function pointer to it, and it schedules that function for future execution. So here's a different way of doing this, this uh, exclusive or nif. We can have our same boilerplate we had before. But then what we're doing here is just setting up a, a new argv. And we're just saying, I'm going to pass in the original binary, the original byte. I'm going to guess again at this 4 meg value. The third argument, number 3, starting at 0, of course, uh, is just 0. And then we allocate this resource. This, this resource thing is built into the NIF library. It's just a way of you allocating some kind of native memory and then passing it to Erlang and having it pass back to you. Since we're dealing with Erlang terms here, I have to do that. I can't just leave it as a C buffer. So um, that goes in, and we basically, right here at the bottom, um, we're calling the schedule NIF. So you can see we're passing the name of the function, a function pointer. That zero I'll talk about later. The six is the number of arguments and the new argv. What that does is returns to the scheduler, because the scheduler is running this code 
And when I return, I'm returning a value back to the scheduler. That value is kind of a special thing that makes the scheduler trap. And a trap is something that's built into the uh, VM. It's how the BIFs work. Uh, basically, it's how exceptions work. You trap back in, and it lets the, uh, the scheduler decide to do something different, like run another process or whatnot. OK, any questions on that? No, I didn't think so. Uh, so XOR2 is interesting, because NIFs previously were always put up into Erlang. That's the whole reason they existed. This is an internal NIF. It's actually being invoked as a regular NIF, but it's only visible within the C code. And uh, what we do here is, as I'll show, we're going to uh, use this function called consume time slice. And what we do with that is we tell it how much of the time slice we've taken. And I'll show how we do that. And that's going to count reductions for us and get our, our reduction count accurate. If we use up a time slice and we're not done yet, we can just reschedule ourselves as we just did. We can also adjust the chunk size uh, based on how much work we got done on that iteration. I have a typo there. Um, so here's our XOR2 kind of internal NIF, and I've cut some of it out, but basically we're just figuring out where we belong in the, the binary that we're processing. Remember, we're coming in and with an offset and a max count of bytes that we should be trying to process. That's that 4 meg chunk. And I'm just setting up some variables to do that. Then I say, hey, time slice, we haven't run anything yet. So you know, we're in kind of initializing the time slice. We then time how long it takes us to run through some of the data, you know, the data that we were told to run through. So say 4 meg, we get time of day, get time of day. Uh, we figure out the math. And this whole big thing right here is basically figuring out the percentage of the slice that we just used. So if a slice is 2,000 reductions, we're getting some uh, percentage of that. And we're telling time slice, consume time slice. We just used up this much of the percentage of the time slice. If that returns 1, that means we used the whole time slice, and we should bail. Um, so to do that, what we're going to do, well, we're not done yet. So we have to adjust our offsets and everything, set up our argv again, and then reschedule ourselves again for the, for the next iteration. Um, if we haven't used the time slice, we might as well try another chunk, go into another chunk. And that way, we can maximally uh, convert the data, XOR the data, but stay within the bounds of the time slice that we're given. And then finally, once we run through all the data, we just turn that resource thing into a binary. So that doesn't do any copying or anything. That, that memory that we allocate is never copied at all. It's just allocated once. It's passed as a pointer. We run through it, drop the new data in, and then return our tuple. We're, we counted how many times the yield, uh, we yielded the scheduler. That's what this yields thing here is. So if we look at that, and we run that in our, in our reduction counter, you can see that it took 5.36 seconds, so that's good. That's the fastest we've seen. It's got over 10,000 reductions, which is perfect because we yielded the scheduler five times. That means the VM told us that we should get out five times, and that means we hit 2,000 reductions. And if you do the math, of course, it's 10,000 reductions. So we're right on reduction-wise. Okay. Now, another approach is to use dirty schedulers. Anybody try dirty schedulers? Anybody know what they are? One guy. Yeah. OK, so we've seen this before. It's our, it's our process architecture, our scheduler architecture. I'm going to make some room in there because I'm going to drop some dirty schedulers in. So basically, we are, there's two kinds of schedulers, dirty schedulers. There's CPU schedulers. And there's one of those by default per core. So they kind of sit right alongside the uh, other schedulers, the regular ones. And they have a shared run queue. So if you go back to version 14 of Erlang, all the schedulers had shared run queues back then. But in 15, they switched to having per scheduler run queue. Um, there's a bunch of migration and balancing work that has to be done to make that uh, viable. We didn't want that for this. So we just made it a, a shared run queue, which is fine. There's also uh, dirty I.O. schedulers. So You'll notice these aren't really tied to any cores. There's 10 of these by default. You can make more of them. Uh, if you're familiar with async thread pools that are in the drivers, there's 10 of those by default as well. So we just use the same number. 
They also have their own run queue shared across all those dirty I.O. schedulers. All right. Um, so to enable dirty schedulers, they're an experimental feature, so they're off by default. Uh, you have to use this enable dirty schedulers uh, switch when you configure your build. And if you have them, you'll see in your status line when you start on Erlang Shell, you'll see that DS8810. That's dirty schedulers, eight CPU schedulers, eight online, and 10 dirty I.O. schedulers. So the 88 is the CPU schedulers. There's also some system info that you can ask and say, do I have dirty schedulers? So you can use dirty schedulers for this problem as well. You can schedule a dirty NIF by calling enif schedule NIF. That zero that was passed in earlier, if you pass a flag and say, I want a CPU or I.O. scheduler, then you'll get onto that scheduler. Um, or you can just specify in your URL NIF funks array that one of those functions is dirty. And uh, like I said, this is in 17.3. just came out last week. Um, it's all documented. Uh, there was an older, dirty uh, scheduler API, but I got rid of that and replaced it with this because it's experimental. That's the nice thing about having experimental code. You don't have to worry about backward compatibility. So here's an example. We're going to have our XOR dirty, the very bottom one there. Um, it's got this flag saying, we're going to run a dirty job on a, a CPU, dirty CPU scheduler. You'll notice that the function, the actual C function, for the bad and the dirty are exactly the same. It's the same function. There's nothing different about it. The only difference is at runtime. That XOR bad is running on a regular scheduler and messing with it. Um, on the dirty scheduler, it doesn't do thread progress, and it doesn't do all those other things that regular schedulers do, and it's intended for this kind of thing, a long-running job. So you, you can just run it over there without any issue. So if we run this through our reduction counter, uh, you can see it takes a little bit longer, 5.95 seconds, only eight reductions, but we don't care. Uh, we don't have to count reductions accurately because we're not on a regular scheduler. Schedule it dirty. That was going to be the original title of the talk, and Garrett nixed it. <laughs> um, so we don't have to do chunking or, or uh, yielding of the scheduler for the dirty scheduler. We can just throw a job over there and let it run. But there's only eight of these things on my eight core machine. So if you, know, if you have some uh, dirty NIF that just keeps running, 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 you're going to take up that entire thread, and then other jobs won't get executed. So you can use enif schedule NIF to reschedule the dirty NIF kind of recursively if you want. Um, that would allow other jobs in the queue to execute. And you can also use enif schedule NIF to flip a function back and forth across schedulers. So you can put it on a dirty scheduler, have it run some chunk of code that maybe takes a while, then decide, well, the next time I'm scheduling this, it's just a regular NIF, or sorry, regular scheduler is fine. I'll just schedule it back over here, run it as a regular thing. The next one can ping pong back. There's actually uh, tests that I put in the uh, OTP test suite that do this and just bounce things back and forth. Um, so the next steps on all this work, I've already started writing dirty drivers. That's a lot more complicated than NIFs. So it's taken me a little while. Um, I'm not sure we'll ever we'll get that into um, Erlang 18. It would be an experimental feature if it gets in there. Then there's something called native processes. If you go to this uh, 2011 presentation by Ricard Green, you can look, read about dirty schedulers. Uh, the, the initial API came from there and everything. But it also talks about these things called native processes. And assuming we get all this done, I've already asked if they would let me work on that. And they said, well, maybe if you finish this other stuff. Um, but the problem is nobody really knows what a native process is. So it might be a while. Thanks a ton to Ricard Green, because without him, there's no way I could have written all this. Uh, Sverker also helped. And Anthony Ramin, Knox, Erlang User of the Year, was in the uh, IRC channel a few months ago, back in the springtime, I guess. And he mentioned, wouldn't it be cool if you had a NIF trap? And I read that. I was like, oh, I know how to do that. And that's where the, I got the idea for ENIF Schedule NIF. So thanks, Anthony. That's it. Oh, and this book, uh, Francesco and I are writing. You may have seen it earlier. I don't know. But uh, 
kind of like Jesse's book, you give what you want, but in this case, it's whatever O'Reilly wants. So <laughs> as long as it's that amount, you can get the book. Okay. Sorry? <laughs> right. So no questions? Any questions? Yes. Have you solved the problem that you had with React? Have you put a final solution in place for those production clients, and what did you end up doing? Okay, the question is, have we solved the scheduler collapse problem for React? And if so, what did we do? We did solve it. Um, it doesn't use this. We're still on R16 with React, uh, so it doesn't use dirty schedulers, doesn't use our, our, uh, our uh, version 17. What we did is we have our own thread pool. We take long-running work and put that off in the, into our own thread pool, and we use that if necessary. We still occasionally see scheduler collapse, uh, and we are not entirely sure why. But I actually think what I've seen with 17, I've never, like I said earlier, I've never been able to make it happen with 17. But I think uh, Max Lapshin, who works on the, some of the video stuff, uh, he posted something on the mailing list recently where he has seen this happen. So uh, I think I'm going to try to get access either to his code or he said I could probably get on a machine and run his code. If that's uh, possible, then I will probably look into it. All right. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Thanks. By the way, this is the first time I've ever given a talk where the, the uh, microphone was actually sweaty when I got it. <laughs> Every conference should be that way. It shows a certain athleticism. Performance art. It's physical. 